17th day of June 2019, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, originating from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but heard in a variety of other places. You know, there's a couple of terrestrial radio outlets that catch us now. There are many individuals that catch us on their radio applications, their fondle slabs of choice being the place they do that. And also the podcast version later on, further on down the stream and all that good stuff. No matter how you're coming to us, welcome to this particular broadcast week. And it is good to start out the week uh, this time with Jordan Maxwell. Now, if you don't know who Jordan Maxwell is, I, 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 I'm not sure how you tied your shoes today or got to my show. So greetings. And yes, indeed, if you go to JordanMaxwellShow.com. Okay, now I, I did say that very plainly, but let's say it again. And there will be a link in the podcast, Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. A lot of other places have his name. A lot of other places use his name. A lot of other places have interviews with him and feature him right at the top of their websites and all that good stuff. But there's only one website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. That is jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, unique things over there, too. The Jordan Maxwell Research Society, which there is a link to immediately, and I'll give you a direct link <laughs> to go and join the Research Society, which has a one-time fee. You get in there and you get into a deep dive of the interconnective world of things that Jordan Maxwell has been teaching people about for more than half a century. Yes, I didn't stutter when I said all of that. Amazing. Anyway, the thing is, you can do that. Join the Research Society. You can take a look at the public page there at jordanmaxwellshow.com. No problem, sure. But also you can make a contribution to Jordan, which goes directly to him. Helps him out. And, uh, you know, those of us that tell the truth don't get paid well. So guess what? You help Jordan out. He is definitely appreciative, and you are directly supporting the individual that supports your right to know certain things, to decode certain things, to show you a great many details about the way governments work, the way banks work, the way the entire world indeed does work. And, hey, how about religion? Another deep dive that you can get into with Jordan is it separate subjects? Kind of, sort of, but not really. <laughs> JordanMaxwellShow.com is the place to go to because it is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. Almost sounds like I'm reading that, Jordan, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, Jordan? Whoops. Maybe maybe we have Jordan on mute somehow. No, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Almost sounded like I was reading that, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does. <laughs> I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you were. But, but well, it's, <coughs> it's, it's, unfortunately, I don't physically have the capability to read that smoothly, so that has to go from memory. Uh, but but nothing I said was untrue, right? No, it was all very accurate, and that is important for people to remember. I have one website called Jordan Maxwell Show. There are other websites out there with my name on it, but they don't belong to me. That's right. Other people are using my name to make money off of me and to trick people into believing it's my website. It's not my website. I only have one. It's called Jordan Maxwell Show That's dot com. That's it. And, that, and as I said, we'll, we'll give you the links directly along with that. And it's the only place that's yours. I also mentioned that they could make a donation over there, which I said you would also appreciate. And I know that's a fact. So, uh, you know, hey, you, one thing I did forget to mention in that little thing that sounded like I was reading, though, is that you also appreciate feedback over there. Uh, email, you know, you, you may not be the fastest uh, uh, guy writing back to people, but you appreciate uh, knowing that you've reached people and that uh, they've learned something. Uh, uh, it, it is a good thing to do as well. So, you know, I advise you to do all of the above. In fact, join the research society, explore the website, uh, definitely contact Jordan, ask him questions, tell him what you think of the presentations you've heard here or elsewhere. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's not about my show. Uh, the thing is just, uh, how about letting him know you appreciate him and also make a donation, do all, all the above. Uh, if, if you have the wherewithal to do so, I suggest you do all of the above. So <laughs> there you go. We have done a long series on religion, and we have done now a couple of episodes devoted to astrotheology. Um, now, I, I, I got to tell you, this is one of those subjects where I think I know it. And, you know, I go and examine it again. I go and take a look at uh, uh, some of the different bits of symbolism that should have been right in front of my face and obvious. And I don't always necessarily know 
what it is I know and what it is I don't know. So it's really great to uh, check back in on this. Now, we've talked to you so far a lot about the sun and obviously how this relates to the, you know, S-U-N and S-O-N. They are the same thing. We've talked to you about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the order of things regarding Virgo the Virgin and exactly why it is three wise men precede the birth of said son. You know, and how these things play out in the heavens, because as above, so below, and all that. Uh, you you reference certain scriptures, and we've gone there. And one might wonder, Jordan. I know that you've probably heard this a million times, but where do you go from the basics of this to understand? And again, as you've said many times, this is not about tell, telling people that what they've been learning is wrong, but this is about expanding their knowledge about uh, uh, about a truth which has not been ever fully told um you know in a in in a public sense by the majority of people that discuss the new testament certainly um and this is again not undermining anybody's christianity here it's about expanding your knowledge and getting you to understand that maybe these stories which have always seemed to repeat themselves one way or another and also are preserved in that New Testament, that, uh, that, that maybe there is a universal truth which is much greater once you get beyond the cartoon version of the story. Um, is anything I'm saying here off, uh, you know, out of line, Jordan, so far? No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, that's precisely what I'm doing. I want people to understand I am not criticizing any religion or anyone's faith. My mother was was a Christian. My father was a Christian. My family were Christian. So I am not criticizing anybody's faith. What I am trying to do is just to educate people as to where our belief systems have come from and then to better to apply, it's easier to apply the wisdom in the scriptures if you understand what the scriptures are saying. You can, if you understand what the story is to begin with, then it all begins to make sense. Because when you read in the Bible about how Jesus had a mother who was a virgin, uh, you know that doesn't make any sense to anyone. But if you understand what we're talking about, Jesus being God's son, the light of the world. The scripture says Jesus is the light of the world. Well, of course, the son, S-U-N, is the light of this world. And so I'm trying to basically hold the, the, the whole thing up to the light, the whole story up to the light of modern day understanding and see where the story of Christianity actually came from and what it actually is supposed to be doing to help you educate yourself spiritually as to the world you live in. And so if you understand that the story of Jesus is the story of God's Son, the light of the world, it's talking about the Son as a most important symbol in mankind's life on the earth. Nothing has more prevailed on the earth in the minds of men as a symbol than the sun. It is the basis for our life. Without the sun, there would be no life, no light. No, there would be no life at all. The earth would have frozen over a long time ago, and there would be no life on the earth, period. But because we have something we refer to as the sun, S-U-N, <clears throat> then once you begin to see that Christianity is based on the worship of the sun. And so we ask the question, who owns the sun? Well, nobody on the earth can say that they own the sun. Well, basically, who would you say owned the sun? Well, theologically, I guess you could say that God owns the sun. So therefore, it's God's son. The light of the world. Of course, the sun is the light of the world. And of course, the sun obviously must belong to God because it doesn't belong to anybody on the earth. So it would be God's son. So we refer to Jesus as the son of God or God's son, the light of the world. And so what we're talking about in Christianity is quite simply the behind the most important symbol mankind has ever, ever come up with. And that is the sun as it arises in the morning. We call it a risen sun. 
And so we say he is risen. Uh, of course it rises. Every morning about 5.30, God's sun rises. <clears throat> and when it rises, where does he go? Into heaven. So we're told that when you die, if you're being good in your life, you'll die and you'll go into heaven to be with God's son. No, you won't go into heaven to be with the son. You will go into a, uh, into your tomb. It will not be in heaven. And so I'm just trying to explain where these ideas have come from and what we believe and where the basis for these beliefs, because to know the truth, it will set you free. And for the first time, when you finally see what I am talking about and you finally get it, most people don't get it. But if you finally see what I'm talking about and it finally dawns on you, that's what the sun will do. People say, well, oh, I see what you mean. What do you mean you see what I mean? Well, because it just dawned on me, meaning the light of wisdom finally shines in my head, and now I finally see what you're saying. So now I'm illuminated. I'm At least now I understand what the scriptures are talking about. It's talking about the oldest story in the whole world that mankind has ever known. And this is why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It is the greatest story ever told. But why? Because it's the oldest story that's ever been told. And the oldest story, of course, is the war in heaven between light and darkness. You can go back as far back as you wish to go, hundreds of thousands of years ago, tens of thousands Millions of years, it doesn't matter. You go back into history as far as your mind can let you understand. Go back into history. There's always been a war going on in heaven between God's son, the light of the world, and his, and his evil brother, Set, S-E-T, in Egypt. The evil brother was also equal to God's son, but he was evil, and so the evil son was called Set. Why? Because he became dark. He he was known as the Prince of Darkness. Right. The Prince of Darkness was Set. Why? Because the Egyptians realized it got dark at sunset. So the sun was God's only son, and since we only have one son, we don't have six of them, we only have one son. So therefore, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He's the only gotten, the only begotten, meaning we only have one son, and thank God for that, because at least we got one son. And if that son ever goes out, then we're dead. If it ever shuts off, we're dead forever, because the son uh, it shares its energy with the whole of our solar system. All the planets get the energy from the sun. And we are very close to it, so we get a lot of energy from the sun. And that energy helps us to grow plants, to keep our, our homes warm, to keep our countries warm, to, to feed us with plants that get their energy from the sun. And so the ancient Egyptians said that the sun was pure energy. That's all it is, is just a one big ball of energy. And energy is life. And energy is life. Therefore, God's Son is giving his energy to the whole solar system. All the planets and all the all the life forms that may be in our solar system are receiving light from the sun that, that belongs to God. So it's God's Son, and the energy is life. So God's Son is giving his life so that you might live. Well, let He's me... Dying. Let me ask you a hard question, because, you know, if you notice in the equations here that you're talking about, one must recognize that there is a time of darkness, which balances out light. There is a time of life, and then death is the answer to life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's always these concepts of, well, like you said, when you die or when the, you know, the sun falls, it sets and falls, uh, to darkness, right? Uh, it rises again and all that. And the concept of going to heaven after death, 
Uh, you know, all of this comes into play, too, because, well, after all, you know, the, the, the heaven is not the, you know, cloudy uh, a place with angels playing harps that they show you in the cartoons, right? It, it It's supposed to be this other realm, and it's definitely not here. Um, yet, there is this idea of lying in your tomb and maybe the resurrection, you know, through him you are resurrected. I mean, there, there's a lot of confusion here when you have to face the other side of the equation. Yep. Right? So of course. What does astrotheology explain about death? Essentially. Well, it just basically it, astrotheology is the most ancient understanding that mankind has ever come up with mm -hmm. because I have said in my book that I wrote and, and some articles I've written that in the ancient prehistoric and ancient world, mankind realized that the sun was its savior. The savior of the human race was the sun. And thank God. Why? Because the sun is risen. Each morning he is risen. And so he's the risen savior of our, of our planet and our, you know, and in, in life on the earth. Because if the sun doesn't rise, we're we're in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to look at the whole story of Christianity and understand it as a metaphor, as a symbolic story of what happens to the sun. Mm -hmm. Whatever Jesus said, that's what the, the son of, of enlightenment would say to a situation. What would something that is pure illuminations, pure knowledge, what would the pure knowledge say about a situation? Well, give it a situation and then read what Jesus said, and that's what the son would say. And then what happens to the son? Well, what happened to Jesus? That's what happens to the son. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the son brings us light, intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. And on this earth, we know that our world today is crowded with people who don't want you to know the light. They're not interested in you enlightening yourself as to how the world works. They want you to stay in the dark and the ignorance so that they can rip you off and lie to you and play you for a fool and bring you into court and have you go to jail. And all because you are in the dark. You don't understand how the world works. Mm. And so that's why Jesus represents the Son. He came to enlighten the world. He came to bring light into the world. That's why the Bible says Jesus is God's Son, the light of the world. Of course, intellectual, spiritual enlightenment comes from nothing else but the Son. The Son is the original bringer of light to the world. And it belongs to God. So it's God's Son, the light of the world. And so what I'm trying to do is to give you an example of how, when you're reading the New Testament, the things which happened to Jesus is what would naturally happen to the Son as a symbolic metaphor. The things that, that Jesus said is what an intellectual, spiritual, intellectual, spiritual knowledge would say about a situation. So when you hear Jesus saying something, that's like the sun who is bringing light into the world. What would the son of God say? Well, read what he said. So when I read that in the Bible that Jesus did this and Jesus did that, I understand it means that the sun being the symbol for life and energy in the world that we live in, here's what happens to God's son. Here's what happens to him. If he tries to educate and intellectually and spiritually enlighten the world, you're going to go to prison. You're going to be thrown into prison. You're going to hang on a cross, and you're going to make you wish you were dead. And they're going to, they will probably put you to death. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the world is not interested in having you tell the people the truth. The, you, know, you can't handle the truth. People, generally speaking, don't want to know the real truth. And that's why today our world is based on lies, deception, misunderstandings, innuendos, all kinds of misunderstandings. Why? Because we're not in the light. So that's why we cannot change the world we live in. As much as we cannot stand the world we're living in, 
You can't change it. Why? Because you don't have the power to change anything. And why do we humans on the earth have no power to change anything? Because knowledge is power. And the sun gives you knowledge. It gives you wisdom. It gives you understanding. It's spiritual, intellectual enlightenment. But what happens to the spiritual, intellectual enlightenment? Well, it says God's son was nailed to a stake and died on a cross. Well, that's exactly right. That's what happens to people who are trying to educate you. They usually end up dead or in prison. And if they come up with a solution to cure cancer, they will be thrown into prison. Or if they know something that's going on and come out in the public and try and tell you and enlighten you, they'll go to prison and they'll go to jail and governments will seek to have you arrested and thrown into prison. Why? Because you're talking too much. You talk about things which are enlightening the people, and they don't want that. Mm. And so that's why I say look at the Bible story of Jesus as a metaphor. What would happen to the sun, which represents spiritual and intellectual enlightenment? And therefore, again, whatever Jesus said, that's what intelligent life would say. Whatever happened to Jesus, well, that's what would happen to the sun of light. The right. son of man. Right. Now, following along with exactly what you just said, right, even though the light is gone at a certain point, it, it must rise again. And indeed, the sun, the S-U-N, continues to rise. And so long as it does, there is life, there is enlightenment, there is wisdom, there is a time when light is cast upon the world for a time, right? And it's unending, even though it seems to be completely gone, completely defeated by the darkness, set winds during the night, right? Uh, That's right. So the sun continues to rise anyway. So even when, see, this is the thing about life after death is almost built into the story, and I think it seems to be represented there as well. I mean, we, we could also talk about, the fact that the uh, you know the twelve guys who are following him around are really the signs you know the different houses of the zodiac, and that makes sense when you uh, step back and look at the procession, and yes indeed, but the idea that it it is a a never ending battle of sorts. I mean, as far as our perspective goes, that we we have no knowledge of a day when there yep. was no it sun. It is a never ending battle, right? So. We have no knowledge of a time when there was no sun permanently, you know, or for even a long period of time, although there are a couple of notations there where it seems like it might have gone away for a little bit longer than a day. But there is always going to be this struggle, seemingly, so long as there is life anyway. Is is that not part of what we're also being told in this metaphor? That's exactly right. In the metaphor, that's what we're being told. <clears throat> God's son has to die on a cross between north, east, west, and south. Uh, on the crosses, on, a, on the churches, you will see on many Christian churches, you will see a cross and a circle on the cross. The circle is God's son who dies on the cross, the cross of the zodiac, the cross between north, east, west, and south. And so the, the, the four points on, on the compass is north, east, west, and south, and you will see on churches, the cross is a crossing between winter, summer, autumn, and spring. Mm -hmm. And so the sun, S-U-N, dies on a cross. That's why you always see on crosses in churches a round circle in the middle of the cross. That's not a man. That's the sun. And therefore, logically begin to look at the stories you read about Jesus and think about it in relation to what the sun, you know, how the sun operates for us. Mm. It's a very interesting story about how the sun pro light, intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. And what happens to the sun? Well, the sun dies eventually. And he leaves, and when the sun dies, he leaves the world in the hands of the prince of darkness. And my, and my thinking, that's probably about where we are right now. The whole world is lying in the power of the prince of darkness because the whole world is in the dark. 
where well, wars and drug addictions and broken marriages and children and kids in jails and prison and all the raping and the criminality and all the horrible things which are going on in the world, the human race is in the dark. We've lost our way. And therefore, we're dying. And therefore, the sun represents spiritual enlightenment. And what happens to God's sun, the light of the world? Eventually, the political leaders will nail you to a cross. Rome was a classic example in the story of Jesus. Rome had enough of Jesus, God's son, enlightening the world. They don't want the, anybody lightning, enlightening the world. They rule by lies, deception, and treason, and all the dirty stuff that goes on in government, and banking, and government. And military, that's how the power works in this world. It's all corrupt and evil. We know that. We understand it. And so that's why governments do not want you talking about things which are in the light. They don't want you enlightening people and telling them what's going on because that causes problems. And people start hearing this kind of stuff, and now they start getting restless and want to do something about it. That's why you've got to give the kids, give the young people who have the energy, give them a lot of sports and alcohol and drugs. Keep the young people on sports, bouncing balls, basketballs, tennis balls, golf balls, bowling balls, ping pong balls. Give the kids and the young people who have a lot of energy, give them a ball. Let them go out and play ball. Mm. And we say that in the corporate world. And if you're going to work for this corporation, you better play ball. You're going to be a team member or not. If you're not going to be a team member, we don't need you. And so the whole idea is to keep people from learning what's really going on. Keep them in the dark and keep them under the prince of darkness. The devil is the prince of darkness in the Bible. Prince of darkness is in Egypt was called Set because it, the, the Egyptians realized they got dark at sunset. And so it's always been this war between God's sons, the two sons of God, the one who was trying to bring light into the world and the one who is the prince of darkness. The sun comes up at 12 hours of, of light in which mankind is in control of his life in this world. And then when the sun goes down, mankind's not in control of anything. You need to have electric lights, air conditioners, and police departments and fire departments because you're not in control of anything and horrible things happen in the dark. And so the dark has always been synonymous with devils and demons and nighttime is a time for murder and violence, etc. So it's the works of the prince of darkness, the works of darkness. So all I'm saying is that it's very simple to understand the words in the story of Jesus if you just try and understand that what we're talking about is what happens to the light in the truth, the truth in the light. Well, the sun is the light of the world. Well, what happens to it? Well, if you try and enlighten people, then you're acting like God's son. You're trying to bring light into the world. They'll throw you into prison. And if you are a brilliant scientist and you figure out how to cure AIDS or cure some terrible disease, or do something that's going to help the human family, the governments of this world will immediately arrest you and you'll be found in an alley with a bullet in the back of your head because the governments of this world do not want the people educated. Mm -hmm. My God, we've got enough problems with people questioning stuff already. And with all the dark stuff that's coming out about the corruption of the human race my god we've already got enough problems without somebody going out and starting to tell people how the world really works and finally starting to wake people up so that now populations are saying oh i see now what was going on now i see it wow. it just dawned on me why the governments are so corrupt why because it's just a business it's only a business like the mafia says well, we like you, but we got to kill you. Why? Because it's a business. It's got nothing to do with personal. And so the world that we live in is one big business. It's a business of life. And so we have a religious business. We have a military business. We have a governmental business. The whole world is a business, Mr. Beale. 
like the movie said. Right. The whole world is a business. Somebody's got to run this planet. And the people who are running this planet don't want you in their way because you're ignorant and ill-informed and you just get in the way. They know what they're doing and they don't want you in their way. So they keep you in the dark. Make sure you got plenty of alcohol on every corner, liquor store in every corner. Make sure you got plenty of drugs, drug donation. Make sure all the people are on drugs and alcohol and make sure their lives are miserable and they're broke and they can't pay for their rent. They don't have money for their bills and they have to worry each day just to stay alive and pay their bills. So they stay out of the boss's way. They stay out of the way of the masters who run our planet. And so they know that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be poor and want to stick together and and do something. So they gave the world something called socialism, communism. Communism was supposedly an opening for the poor people of this world to come together and band together to do something about the darkness that we're in and all the corruption. So it was called socialism. And the socialism is all the common people of the world getting together to fight against the corrupt politicians and the bankers and all the big shots. But what people don't realize is that the socialism was founded, financed, and organized by the Rockefellers, by the international banking cartels of Europe. They're the ones who founded the world socialist movement. So all you'll see is the poor people out in the street with their plaques and their signs talking about socialism and we need to overthrow the government and how the Democratic Party is talking about we need to kill the president and he needs to be thrown out and and, and charged with crimes and kick him out of Washington, D.C. Why? Because the poor people, the poor want him out of here. No, in point of fact, the poor people voted for him. And so the socialist movements are actually financed by the Rockefeller Brothers Trust Fund. If you go back into history and find out the Soviet Union was financed by the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds of Europe, the Warburgs of Europe, of England, the international banking cartels financed, organized, and directed the Soviet Union. They're the ones who founded the Soviet Union and paid for the Communist Party to come into life. Mm. And so that's bringing light into the world when people see that. And finally, now they begin to see, oh, I see. The Democratic Party is nothing but a financial master plan to rip off the people of this world thinking they're doing it for the poor people. Uh No, what they're doing is they're keeping you poor and ignorant. That's why they don't want people coming around talking about what's really going on in world politics See, and how this government actually in yeah. fact works. What's really great about it, though, is once you get beyond looking at how the communism and all of that was organized by certain elites, guess what? Uh, the extreme opposite of that. <laughs> Every one of these things that they say were right-wing movements that were quite extreme that uh, were fascistic or whatever, almost all of them, if you look hard enough, you find, guess what? The Fords, <laughs> the Carnegies, right. the, uh, you know, the DuPonts, uh, all backing these people. Yeah, the, the, exactly. It's, it's amazing that it's like, you know, almost as if they got together and had a meeting, Jordan. Not saying that they did, but I'm saying it's almost as if the big families on the planet got together and said, look, we need to divide up the left and right wing part of this and give people the illusion that they're resisting on one side or the other, depending on which way the wind blows. And they give it to you in these self-destructive uh, insanities on the extremist, no. extremist point of view. And, and, and one way or the other, you're, you're tugging at a rope thinking you're fighting an enemy, but what you're really doing is backing yourself over a cliff. That's and exactly right. And it, that's why... Yeah. And the basis for that kind of thinking, for this kind of political understanding, is the fact that man cannot move on this earth without two legs. He cannot do any work without two arms. You can't see very well without two eyes, two uh, two ears to hear correctly. So man cannot move around the earth without his two legs. 
birds cannot fly without two wings. They can't do it while one wing don't work. They have to have two wings operating together, a left wing and right wing. And so we now know that this is how the world is actually being able to be moved. People in high powerful positions can move this whole world. Why? They can either move it to the left or to the right. The left is always the communistic and the right is always the nationalistic. It's the, it's the, what we call the National Socialist German Workers Party, Nazis, or the Communist Party, which is the Democratic Party. And so the, it's been known that you can't go anywhere if you don't have two of everything. So if you're going to walk, you need two legs. And you can't walk on a glass surface with oil on it. It's just not going to work. You, you need friction. So if you can't walk on a marble or a glass floor if it's got oil on it, why? Because there's no friction for you to walk. You need two different legs and you need friction for you to walk and for you to move. So if the international bankers want to move the world towards something, they will cause friction. International friction or international strife and war, they will cause kinds of wars between people, between religions, between governments. They are financing, organizing, and directing all of this wars and, the, and all the tragedies. And this is why even the Masonic Order has these has the term ordo ab chao, order out of chaos. Order out of chaos. Mm. And this is why when I was a kid in school, when somebody would say something in high school and junior high, get uh, get a life or wake up, it meant that you were ignorant and ill-informed, you need to get an education. And, uh, and so they make a television show what was it called was in, in the 50s? That TV show was, um, oh, Get Smart. Yeah, that's what it was, Get, Get smart. smart. Well, in high school, for me, when I was a kid in high school, Get Smart, somebody told you to get smart and implied, go get an education, wake up, you're stupid, you're ignorant, get smart. And so they make a television show in, this, in the 50s called Get Smart. And in Get Smart, there are two sides. There's an evil side and there's a good side. And what are the two sides in the television comedy, Get Smart? There was one was called Chaos and the other was Control. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's how you control people is you cause chaos. Because if you walk on glass with oil, there's no friction. So you've got to have friction. You've got to have people fighting each other. Have a man fighting his wife, have the children fighting their parents, have governments fighting each other. Everybody's got to be against somebody else because you've got to have two legs to walk on. You've got to have two wings to fly. Well, see, I want to and run so, a, a third idea by you here. <laughs> and yeah. the reason is because we're, we're, we're in the third dimension, and I, and, and I see the triangle, the equilateral triangle as something that is extremely important. And I'll tell you why. Um, you're, you, you said you need two eyes to see. Well, you don't need two eyes to see. But here's the thing. When you do have two eyes which work equally well, what they essentially do from two different perspectives, if they are working well, they create an image in your mind that allows you to know the depth, that allows you to know the distance. This is triangulation. Um in order to walk with those two feet like you were talking about, what is achieved there, it is balance that is achieved because one pressure can actually mediate the other, and this is why there needs to be two things in order to create a third effect. Now, what's fascinating to me is this idea of control and chaos, and the fact that it seems like the argument, no matter what you're talking about, uh, whether it is religion or it is politics or anything else, is really between exactly how much control and chaos you want. Uh, one of the sides of the equation generally presented has a lot of control in it. Jordan, it just does. It controls everything almost because it just runs everything. The other side of it asks for a lot of chaos. Now, here's the fun part about that is between these two things, the result that's created 
is a struggle. And the struggle is generally more between the people who are attempting to navigate this than against the people that are actually running the program. So what I find relevant here is that there is a triangulation at all times. That triangle, which does become a pyramid when you bring it into the third dimension, and also, don't forget, we're in the third dimension, um, you know, just seems to make sense. And you say to yourself, well, this is how balance is achieved from two different perspectives that are not in and of themselves correct. But when you take a look at them and bring them together and have them work properly, you can see the depth and you can see the distance and you can see the reality and you can see in 3D. So what's really, really strange here is that, again, going back to astrotheology, the sun and the moon, they do this dance across the sky, and each of them owns half of the day. They mm -hmm. just do. You know, 12 hours over your head is lit. 12 hours over your head is dark, effectively. Uh, on balance, the two things, because there is a break from the sun, and the sun is essential, but also the break from the sun is helpful. It allows things to cool down, because if the sun just continued to pulsate on something and never moved off of it, right, it, it, it would actually, yeah, it would create life, but then it would create death, too. So it seems like the stars know what to do. It seems like the planet knows what to do. The question then becomes, why does it seem like there is so much darkness intentionally over the planet? And by darkness, I do mean ignorance. I do mean the ugliness, you know, man's inhumanity to man, man's irresponsibility to the planet, man's cruelty to animals of a lesser intelligence, uh, uh, man's lack of an ability to take care of himself. All, all really rooted in ignorance, which is that darkness, right? How is it that that is out of balance when it seems as though the stars, it seems as though the lessons, it seems as though the religions and all other things get the message about the balance, but men are not getting it? Why, why is that happening? Is that too broad of a question, Jordan? Yeah, it's a very good question because mankind's not getting the truth because they don't want the truth. Mm. There's a very big uh, dimension to this, and that is your desire to know. Most people do not have a desire to know. They're too busy trying to earn a living to pay their rent, utilities, and stay alive and eat and protect their families. So they don't have time to worry about and think about and sit and study all day ancient theologies, ancient religious beliefs and political philosophies and how the world really works. Most people do not have that kind of time. I do. I have devoted my life since I was 19 years old, knowing full well that in my later years I will have zero nothing. I will not own anything or have anything because I'm going to spend my entire life reading and studying and looking at the world I live in. And I already realize that, that while I'm doing that, I'm not making money. I'm out, not out there taking care of my family. I'm not out there taking care of me and making money and building a bank account. I'm out there doing what I want to do. And it's going to cost me. I'm not going to be able to do the things other people and other men can. I'm not going to have a family. I'm not going to have a home. I'm not going to have what the other people want. I'm not going to be able to do that. But what I do want, and I will pay for it, whatever it costs, is I want the knowledge. I want to know. I want to not believe anything. I want to know the facts of life. I want to know where things have come from what the words mean and how the people in power got in power and who gave them the power and who's ultimately in charge of the earth and who wrote the laws. We're all under law. Yeah, well, who wrote the law? What law? And then when you talk about God, God to me is simply dog spelled backwards. What do you talk about when you say God? Define your terms. Define what you mean. So many mm -hmm. people talk about things they, they think they believe, but when you ask them privately, explain to me what you mean by heaven <clears throat> or explain to me what you mean by hell. 
most people have no idea in the world how to explain anything because they don't understand it to start with. It's just something they've learned because they were born and raised into the environment. And where they were born and raised, they were they were raised in a particular culture, and so the particular culture impacts their thinking. And that today we got all kinds of people around the world who believe that what they think and what they believe is the truth, mm-hmm. and everybody else is wrong. Which, in point of fact, is just the opposite of actual history. What most people believe is the truth is not the truth. It's a made-up story, and you bought into it because the story was made up before you were born, before your grandmother was born. There was already a story, and the people of the world had already bought the story and had already promoted the story. And so hundreds of years later, you come into the world, and you're born as a baby into that culture, and the stories are, like Hitler said, you know, if you tell the same story over and over again, eventually people will begin to understand it and believe it. And so if you continue for a thousand years to keep talking about somebody who died on a cross, a man who died on the cross and who rose again from the dead, etc., and he was God's son, you keep doing that for a thousand years, and eventually down the line, you're going to be born, and you're going to be brought into it, brought into it, and you're not going to know anything more about it than the people who are telling you about it. This way, the blind, the blind lead the blind, and both fall into the pit. And so that's what I realized a long time ago, and I knew it was going to cost me, and so that's what I did. I wanted to know, and I got what I wanted. I wanted to know. I wanted to have the knowledge, and I did. And I studied and I continually sought after individuals I felt had something of value to say. And I would go to their lectures. I would go to the teachers. I would write letters to important people around the world. And eventually I started to begin to see how the world actually works after 60 years. Mm -hmm. And it's really and very encouraging for me to see young people starting to wake up because maybe – Possibly, and I've said this before, I don't believe there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I think the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming. Mm. But it very well might be that the world is changing and that it very well might start to begin to change for the good, for the betterment of the human race when more people come into the light, turn on the light, and come into the light of this world and enlighten your mind. Read and study and understand and question. Because like I said, too many people in in America especially are too interested in trying to earn a living to pay their rent and pay their bills. They don't have time to sit down and study. Well, I did. And so I'm trying to give you this kind of knowledge. I'm trying to explain it to you. What I have paid my whole life to learn, I'm trying to teach you, you know, and I'm doing it the best I can. I'm trying to explain to you that all of the world's stories that you have been told are all based on a more, far more ancient mythologies and ideas that have come down through thousands of years of mankind. As I said in my in my one of my videos, that <clears throat> mankind has always had these questions about who we are, where do we come from, where is God, if there is a God, what's going to happen to us when we die, where do we come from before we were born, and so when mankind began to ask these kind of questions, there were no answers. The universe didn't give you any answers. So we had to sit down and start thinking about it and come up with a logical understanding of uh, to the questions that we're asking. Well, logically, we begin to understand where man comes from and the the procreation of the human family. And then we begin to see how intellectual enlightenment is always being tried to stamp out people who are educated are not very much appreciated in the society we live in because they know things you don't know and they're not about to take part in what you're doing because they know better. And so if they're not taking part in what you do and what you live in, then you don't like them. They're not like you. So therefore you will turn against them because you don't support them. You don't have anything to do with them. Why? Because you don't like them. They're not like you. Mm. <clears throat> and that's why the politicians know that. 
politicians realize give the people what they want and they will support you. Tell them what they want to hear and they will like it and then they will support you. If you tell them the truth, they're not only not going to support you, you may be assassinated. You may wake up one morning and find out you've been killed because you know too much and you are causing too many problems among the people. The national leaders are not appreciative of you trying to wake the people up. They don't want the people woken up. That's what we've been feeding them, alcohol and drugs and movies and entertainment and ball games and all the rest of this crap. We've been trying to keep the people occupied and stupid and ill-informed and unread. Purposely, we designed a school system that does not only not teach people, but it actually keeps you stupid. And so that's why uh, Bertrand Russell said many years ago, if you want to be, if you want to be wise and intelligent, go to the library and sit and read. If you want to be stupid, go to go to school. They'll, they'll teach you what stupidity is. You'll come out and you won't even know, you know, you won't understand nothing when you come out of school. Why? Because we've designed the school to do just that. We've designed it to make sure that if you go to school, you'll come out ignorant, ill-informed, unread, dim-witted, and totally confused. That's what we do in school. Unless there's an individual that comes into the picture who doesn't want to go with the regular crowd. He doesn't want to follow the crowd. He wants to do his own thinking. Well, that's mm. the kind of person that gets in trouble. We don't want you on this company. We don't want you in this company. Yeah, we want a team player. This is a citizenship, and we run a tight ship. And so we want you to be a team player. You go along to get along. You get it, mate? Oh, of and course. So, and, and the interesting yeah. thing is, you know, when, when you speak out of school, <laughs> right, uh, it usually means you said something you shouldn't have, and you said something that you didn't know anything about you weren't supposed to say. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. Or you knew thing. too much. Or you knew too much. That's the interesting part about that. But when I hear the word school, I got to tell you, Jordan, I, I also, everything seems to go back to water, which is another thing, too. You know, we, we talked about the sun and that being the essential of life, but <clears throat> water is another one. Uh, there, there's nothing on this a planet which lives that doesn't require water in one way or another. Right? That's right. And there's uh, virtually nothing on this planet that doesn't come water in some way or other that's uh, right you know so water is important too and here's the thing about the school when i hear the word school what do i think of is big collectives of fish which you know they do swim in the same direction and look a school of piranhas pretty scary yes indeed but a school of bluefish kind of dumb and they bite each other even because they see shiny things in the water and it's really just that way but you see, a school of fish means that, yeah, there 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 are some fish at the, at the head of that school, if you will, the head of that class, and they might see exactly which direction everybody's going in. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of the fish in the school of fish, and that's literally what a grouping, you know, very much like a, a, a grouping of crows is a murder, uh, you know, sheep are a herd, uh, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, that's precisely right, and that's why we are called fish because we bet you bought into something you bet and so we're fish mm -hmm. and that's why we go to school and school goes back to a jewish word shul right and shul is a meeting place for the jews and their worship of the shul or school and so the our school system is the educational system is to make sure you stay stupid and if you start asking too many questions in college, you are kicked out. I don't care how much money you paid. You're out of here. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're causing all the other students who are happy drinking their beer and going to the sex parties and watching the football games. You're causing the students to become concerned and start asking questions. And now we got problems in the class. we got problems with too many school kids asking too many questions that we can't answer we don't want to answer and you're the one that's causing them to wake up and ask these questions so we don't want to hear from you anymore we've had enough of you so you're kicked out or thrown into jail or you'll lose your license to be a doctor if you're telling people things they're not supposed to know 
And so people who want to do something to help their fellow man, today's world, you will go to prison and you will probably be taken out. You'll probably be removed from the world. Well, but, and but they'll here's, find your body someplace. See, but here's the thing about that school of fish as we're about ready to go to break here. And I actually uh, uh, found an interesting email that I want to run by you. I, I forgot about it because we hadn't done the show in a couple of weeks. Uh, that a listener sent in that we'll address in the next hour. And if anybody else wants to, by the way, we do uh, uh, take input and questions in the chat room. Or if you email them to me, I forgot to mention that at the top of the show. But uh, we do take questions during this time when Jordan is on with me. Uh, and I'm going to get to an interesting one. But here's the thing about that school of fish <laughs> that, that I can't get away from. I, I realize it comes from the, you know, the word for shul and all that. But I can't, I can't get the school of fish out of my head, Jordan. And you know why? Because the majority, and I do mean the overwhelming majority of the fish in the school, uh, again, do not see anything except the tail of the fish in front of them. That's I right. mean that that's how how much more of a metaphor do you need uh <laughs> you know for the word i mean i'm I'm not saying you jordan obviously you've you've got a million of these sorts of observations, but it's just to me that this is the one that stands out, and I think it's a fair one to to mention that uh, when it comes to school and being in a school that that is very much like those fish all grouped together who only a very few even have an idea where it's going. Only yep. a very few know anything that's actually happening because in front and behind the rest of them is another fish. And like I said, even if they're even if they've got their eyes open, all they're seeing is the tail end of a fish just like them. That's so, exactly right. And that's why we say if you're not the lead dog, for you the scene never changes. Mm. You don't know where you're going. You just follow the other dog's butt in front of you. You don't know where you're going. Just keep walk just keep Pounding, pounding the pavement, and running like all the other dogs, and follow the lead dog. The lead dog is the one that's seeing in the future. He's out in the front, and so all you have to do as a dog is just follow. Just whatever, wherever the lead dog goes, that's where you go. Mm. Because if you're not the lead dog, for you, the scene will never change. True enough. But as we go to the break here, you know, Jordan Maxwell is with us. And uh, you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com if you want to continue on with even anything that's been evoked in this conversation. But astrotheology is the main focus, despite the fact that it does tie to just about, well, everything apparently, when you start to break these things down. Because the metaphor and symbols, they Ocelli are begins every now originating from Ocelli.com, but like I say, heard in a variety of other places. Anyway, this particular moon day or Monday, we do have Jordan Maxwell with us. And if you want to continue on with your education after this show, or hey, if you want to pause it and go over there now, you can do that too, because you're listening to it on a podcast, whatever, through your podcatcher du jour, that's just fine too. You go over to Jordan Maxwell Show. Now, you got to put all three of those words together in one, jordanmaxwellshow.com. That's how you do it. You get to the only website, and I do mean the only website. That is Jordan Maxwell's. His face, his name, and a lot of other places, but truth is, that's the only one that's his, jordanmaxwellshow.com. There is the Research Society over there, which I am a member of, and I urge you to join. There is the donate button over there, which uh, uh, obviously, if you appreciate the information that Jordan has brought you over the years and are able to do so, Jordan would appreciate something from you. And Jordan didn't ask me to say that. I'm just telling you. (laughs) Okay, bottom line. Uh, You can email Jordan. You can look at the public section. You can uh, uh, hear a couple of shows and take a look at some other interesting articles. Uh, But you get deep into the research society, and you can go for deep dives on things like religion, money, government, uh, language, and exactly how all these things interact in the grand equation of the world around you. And also religion and astrotheology, which is the main focus of uh, what it is we're discussing tonight. Now, we've gone in a couple different directions, um, and it's about to get even more diverse, I think, (laughs) because I I have uh, one email that I'm going to read to Jordan here during the course of this time. We may have a caller join us via Skype uh, somewhere in the next little while. But meanwhile, back to the discussion with Jordan 
uh, because, hey, you know what? We've only got just so much time left here on this particular Monday night. Um, Jordan, where, where do you want to go next? Do you want to go with the email, or would you like to continue on with the thought that I sort of interrupted in the first hour, or what, what do you think? Well, I think you're the host. You tell me. I'll put it on you. Okay, fair enough. Jordan volleys back to Chuck. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know, I think of it like a tennis match. Like, whoop, I served the ball to you. What are you going to do? He volleyed it back. Um, yeah. I you put know, the ball back in your court. <laughs> you put the ball back in my court. And, of course, there's a lot to be said about that. But you got to tune into the first hour to hear about the ball in the court. And Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, an interesting email here from... Uh, uh, Roderick, okay, and and I say this because I think he's the only Roderick I've ever heard from, uh, who who has listened to the uh, special dogmatic theology series. Appreciates that. Uh, is very grateful that we did uh, uh, that series uh, one after the other, and is happy to see that uh, the majority of them have made it to YouTube. Yes, I know there's still a couple that have not gotten up there because YouTube restricted my ability to do things briefly, but I believe I may be able to uh, get those up soon. Okay, just so you guys know. Anyway, um, what else? What does he say? Oh, right. He was listening to a show uh, where I (laughs) had said some things that he wanted me to run by you. Um, But you weren't on that show. And they tie to just about everything you were talking about. Okay, Uh, let's see here. Okay, you know what? The essential question is because I ended up saying that uh, that that quite frankly every time um, I have a belief in my lifetime I look back on it and I realize that uh, once I get to know something that uh, uh, that that contradicts that belief you know my beliefs are just things that I don't really know about and I said that beliefs were dangerous And I said that, uh, quite honestly, it is beliefs that get people killed out of ignorance because they are very much based on ignorance and that there was a great difference between belief and knowledge. Um, And they wanted me to run it by you. So they're asking me if uh, if I would have you give a similar explanation, because I gave a whole half hour thing on this uh, one night where there is a huge difference between belief and knowledge or knowing, like you said, you wanted to know things, you didn't want to believe them. And you make that distinction as well. Uh, so they are asking basically, uh, you know, t- Jordan Maxwell, tell us what is the difference between belief and knowledge? Well, I was, uh, is, I think it was probably be pretty obvious what we're trying to say in talking about those two subjects, belief and knowledge. I think it's pretty obvious. The idea being is if you believe something, <clears throat> you don't know for sure. You're looking, you're, you're understanding the best you can and the best you can come up with. And we say that, well, this is what I believe. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is what I believe. Well, that's a subjective opinion. That's what you believe. It doesn't mean that's the truth. Because, well, what is the real truth about any subject? Well, I don't know, but this is what I believe. So the idea being is if you have a belief, it doesn't mean it's true. It just means that's the way you see things. And you're the, way, the way you view it, that's your view. And so that's why the Founding Fathers said we all have a right to have our own view. And that's what I've said so many times. I think the world has a right to my opinion. (laughs) And I think that uh, my opinion is not based on necessarily something I've read or heard or been told when I was a child, but my opinion is based on things which I have actually with my own eyes seen. And with my own life, I have been involved in things which I have been taught because of those experiences, but the real bottom line truth is about the world I live in. I have had too many experiences which were very frightening to me. Some of them were very dangerous and very scary. 
But I look back on all of my life, and I now see that I have had to learn a lot of lessons the hard way because I have my own beliefs. I believed in Jesus. I believed in the church. I believed when I was a young youngster. But as I began to grow older, I began to have questions. And the more I would question, the more I began to perceive that this is not what this is not very smart. You need to keep your mouth shut and don't have any questions. Well, I know that's the basis for tyranny. If you can't ask questions and you don't have any answers, then that's a, this is a basis for ignorance. And so I always wanted to know. I don't care what you don't like with me asking questions. I want to know. And so I realized that you have to do it on your own. Nobody's going to help you. You want to know there's a lot of information out there. Just open your mind because your mind's like a parachute. It don't work if it's not open. <clears throat> so open your mind and realize for the first time in your life, because something you hold to be very important and very dear and very real may not be real at all. And so I ask you, I ask people in the past, have you personally ever been fooled or lied to and you believe something that somebody told you have you ever been lied to and and then found out later on that what you were told was not true has that ever happened to you no. well of course that's happened everybody's had those experiences where you thought you knew something and it wasn't true well then that uh, that implies that you are fallible that you are human and can make mistakes right. and if that's the case then how do we know what you think you understand now is, in fact, the truth. Maybe you made a mistake, so maybe somebody was very smart and very clever and deceived you, and you were young and, and impression, you were impressionable as a, as a child or as a young person, and you believed what you were being told, but there was no proof of it. You were just told, here's the way it is, son, and this is the way it is, and this is what you need to believe, and that's it. And so you go through your life believing that until one day at 80 years old, you settle down and for the first time, you start thinking about your life that you've lived all your life and what you have believed about life. <clears throat> and now you begin to understand for the first time about government propaganda, lies, religious beliefs. And, and the and the schools and how they kept you ignorant and ill-informed and lied to you and didn't tell you the truth and all kinds of tragedies begin to come up in your mind. How much, you know, if you've been lied on this or that and you see it's a lie, what else have you been told that's not true? And then you begin to really go down what they call the rabbit hole, which I've done. I've already done that. And how I begin to see the real truth is the world we live in is filled mm -hmm. with lies, deception, and corruption, period. And that's why so many young people around the world are on drugs and alcohol and turning to sex and alcohol and entertainments and loud music, etc. And so many have fallen into, uh, into criminal activity because they have not been brought up correctly the parents have not been able to raise the children correctly to show them what is real legitimate de jour provable truth and stay on their and and stay on their minds stay on their heads and make sure that, that the children are continually in your care understanding how the world works what they can do what they can't do and why the world works the way it does. Well, see, parents don't know those things, so they can't teach their children. And therefore, the children grow up to be ignorant, ill-informed, Ill unread, and ignorant. Then they have children themselves, and their children grow up to be ignorant, ill-informed, and uninformed. And my God, one day you wake up, and there's seven and a half billion people on the earth that have an IQ of 40. And there's a, there are some people on this earth that are so incredibly intelligent that they're able to balance it out so that uh, the handful of people are brilliant, comp you know, putting together computers and computer programs for us to run government, to run 
the utilities, the run uh, universities, very, very highly intelligent, brilliant people. Does that mean they're good and they're holy and moral? No, it just means they're very bright and intelligent. Mm. And they are put to work by governments. Governments come in and they give you IQ tests when you're a kid. Why? Because the IQ test was designed as a tool in the hands of military. The people who run this world want to know who are the smart kids and who are the regular ignorant dummies. Who are the real smart ones? Because when we find some kid that's got an extraordinary intellect and we test him with an IQ test and we see this kid is smart, he picks up on stuff quickly, he is very, very bright the way he analyzes things, we need to bring him in and give him a, a, a scholarship and bring him in and put him in the military. We'll hire him to work for the CIA and the NSA, National Security Administration. We will hire him to, you know, for the work, to put him to work for the U.S. government because this kid's smart. Why? Because we know because he's taken an IQ test. And so that's what the IQ test was all about, to separate the really brilliant children from the regular kids who are never going to go anywhere. They don't know from nothing. They don't care about nothing. They're just having fun drinking their beer and going to the ball game. And they'll end up being, you know, just end up being regular, ordinary people who will go along to get along and do whatever they're told to do because that's the way everybody else lives, except for those handful of extraordinarily brilliant young people who are working for NSA and working for governments and underworld organizations and corrupt societies, secret societies, and they become the lawyers, they become the attorneys, they become the brilliant minds that manipulate the world. And so I understood this a long time ago, and I realized the only way I'm going to be able to do it is do it on my own by myself. Right. And so I educated myself because every day I spent almost every day of my life in a, in a library somewhere, UCLA, County, USC, University, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, theological seminaries, libraries, all sorts. I mean, I used to photocopy documents. I have boxes and boxes and boxes of photocopies of documents on all kinds of subjects from government to war to how the secret societies operate, who prints your money, where, why, why do we have banks, what is a bank, and then when you get into the dark history of banking and money and the underworld operations, the organized criminal syndicates out of Europe and how they, put, uh, how they came by you know, putting America together and the people who founded this country and who were they and how did they do it and where did they get the money, it's really quite a world, it's quite a story about the world we live in that most people have never bothered to even know about. And so I feel that I'm trying to educate my mankind. And by doing so, I, my, I can't kick the feeling that what I'm doing is trying to empty the Pacific Ocean with a cup. There's only one of me, and I'm trying to tell the people of the world to wake up educate yourself and start looking at the dark side of life mm -hmm. start looking at the real legitimate world you live in and find out where these things have come from that's where the real story is right find out where the idea of banks come from money comes from then you find out that banks were dreamt up by somebody called the knights templar masonic lodge the Knights Templars was a Catholic Masonic underworld organization. They're called the Knights Templars. Steven Spielberg made movies about the Knights Templars in the Indiana Jones series and the Star Wars. All of that deals with the Knights Templar. The Masonic orders of Knights Templars gave you what you call today banking, international banking. <clears throat> And then what you start, now you see where the banking comes from. Well, now where does the printing of money come from? Now it gets interesting because now you're getting into banking and law and money and how they own your body and your body as a security on the New York Stock Exchange. It's a real dark world we live in. And people have no idea in the world 
what's really going on. I've been and I and at almost eighty years old. I'm getting so tired of talking after sixty years. I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do what I do. That's why I want to leave a legacy, a website, Jordan Maxwell Show, so that people can go on. And when you go on my website, Jordan Maxwell Show, there's a whole website we're changing. I'm having to my my webman is changing the website within the next two weeks. We're having to change the website because when you go on my website, you will see a large. Uh, uh, something, a large opening, and it's a video I did. But there's more to that website. Scroll down underneath of that video. Scroll down, and you will see a massive website. And then you will also see a Jordan Maxwell Research Society website. That's a second website that I own, but it's, you, you get it off of my home website, which is Jordan Maxwell Show. It's called Research Society. Mm -hmm. Click on it and join it, and then you will see all the documents, audio, videos, documents, uh, you know, places to go, links to go, people to hear, all kinds of research I've been doing over the years about banking and government and churches and religion and the different institutions around the world, who owns them, where did they come from, and how you've been lied to and deceived. And most people have never seen that kind of information in their whole life. Mm. And it's all right there on my website under Jordan Maxwell Research Society. Right. And as I said, I'm a member over there. So when you go in there, there is uh, audio, video, books, articles, images, you name it, any type of media you can uh, think of, respectively, that you can access uh, for yourself to uh, to see exactly how this works for yourself or to hear. <laughs> you know how Jordan was talking about, I see what you're saying. Well, you can see what he's saying, but you can also actually see some things in there as well, uh, including uh, uh, entire books and suggested reading and articles and relevant information to uh, to all of what is being explained in each section, by the way. There are many, many sections in there. Um, so the, the last part of what Roderick had to say, uh, was, uh, that he felt as though it, it would rub Jordan Maxwell the wrong way if you said what you said on your show to me. Okay. And, uh, so I'm just going to say it to you in short <laughs> and see if it does. I don't think it will. Um, I stated that beliefs were dangerous, and the reason why I said this is because I am far too often confronted by people who start sentences with, I believe. Their I believe sentences uh, from on high, from politicians, from people that are in charge of things, seem to think that their beliefs are the primary reason for taking action. And I am not pleased by any of that because... A belief by its nature itself implies that you don't know, okay, what it is you're saying. You believe it, okay, and, and you can believe a lot of different things, okay. If you have no evidence of it, you're making decisions in the world based on something where you are admitting you do not have all the information automatically. And... <laughs> So I said this is a dangerous thing to do, to make decisions out of ignorance, because a belief automatically implies some ignorance. Now, I know that sounds a little rough, but it is but the it's difference. True. Okay. So, I mean, does that rub you the wrong way, Jordan? Did I say something crazy no, there? No, no. I mean, it's factually true. Okay. Factually correct. That's If you say, almost... I believe, yeah, well, I can sit in front of of a master magician that's doing card tricks, and I see him doing all kinds of strange things as a master magician, and it's just spellbinding in my mind how he does this. And how can he do that? It's spellbinding. But knowing uh, intellectually, I understand, no, it's a trick. He's doing something with your mind. He's, he's a professional at what he does, and he's causing you to think one thing, and making a sound or making a, a comment or something, knowing full well he's leading your mind to buy into what he's doing. And all the time, that's why he is a master magician, because he's tricking you into believing something. And uh, I've watched so many master magicians on television. 
and they are very good. The guys who are really good, they are phenomenal. How they could do things, there's just no way to explain it. But there obviously has to be a way to explain what they were doing. And I've had people do that in my life. I've seen people come in and do things and show me tricks that I don't understand even today. Looking at it, I could not understand how they did it. But they did it. And they can do it every time. And it just blows my mind when I watch them do something I've seen them do four or five times, and every time it works the same way, and I still don't understand it. Well, how about this, Jordan? You know, you you mentioned Steven Spielberg. They call those special effects that you're talking about where they demonstrated all that stuff that you had just sub-referenced really quickly. You know, they call that movie magic, Jordan. So what is it that movie magic does? What is the phrase? You suspend disbelief. So let's break that down. Let's reverse engineer it real fast. To suspend means what? To stop something, put it on hold, at least temporarily. To suspend That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? So what is disbelief? Well, let's remove the dis from it. It is belief, right? And to disbelieve it is to not believe something, basically. I mean, that's about as basic as you can get, right? So you are stopping temporarily your ability to not believe something. So in a roundabout, long-form way, you are allowing yourself to believe temporarily what it is you're looking at. Yes, and that's why it is said, and I've heard this said before by teachers, that propaganda does not deceive you. Propaganda merely helps you yourself. You're the one that bought into it. You should have had enough sense to know it was a trick to start with and start thinking of it, what you're seeing, in a relation to a trick. How Mm -hmm. would the trick work? But if you really believe what you just saw the magician do, it's just a it's just a magical trick. But there's got to be an answer to it. And there's a lot of programs on on YouTube talking about how magicians do their tricks. Right. And it looks very very good when he's doing it. Very interesting. But then when you see how he actually did it. Then you say, oh, okay, now I see. Well, what do you mean you see? Well, now I understand. Now I'm in the light. My my brain's been lit up, and now I see the thing for you, what it is. You've lifted your suspension on disbelief is what yeah, you've done. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and that's, that's the key, though. Again, you're talking about magic. I say movie magic. It's the same thing. What did you just see, Jordan? Well, I just saw, pick a movie. I just saw a car crash. I just saw a guy get shot. I just saw, you just saw that. No, you didn't. You saw the illusion of it. That's (laughs) right. You saw the illusion. But for a moment, while you were watching it, you believed that's what you were seeing because you suspended your disbelief. This is the problem with beliefs because all of the information says it is a trick. It is an illusion. It is something that is created by editing, special effects, or, you know, uh, 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 let's just say uh, intricate camera work. doesn't matter what the trick is. Point is that one way or another, the belief is automatically based on at least partial ignorance to the subject. So when people are telling you, this must be done because I believe. They are literally telling you that an action must be taken because in partial or complete ignorance, they've decided this is what they want to see or know or whatever. Is that not an adequate explanation? When you hear someone say, this is what must be done because I believe, no matter if it's a politician Mm -hmm. or somebody at the uh, pulpit, uh, it doesn't matter, your family, anywhere. When you hear someone say, I believe, so therefore this is... Yeah, well, see, this is why I have always far more uh, been interested in when I ask an adult who is highly educated, and they say, all right, sit down and be quiet, and let me explain to you what you think is happening, and then let me show you what's actually happening. And then I listen to them explaining what I already thought and what I already knew was happening, and then when they go into the the background of where it really came from and what's really going on, then I begin to say, "Wow, I didn't know that. The, I didn't know all of these facts about life." That's why. That's why in the military you're told you just are given an order, you just follow the order. Why? Because the 
the uh, superior above you knows things you don't know, and he's not stupid, and he's been told things that's actually going on that you are not being told, and therefore he's making his decision for what you have to do because he knows what's going on. You don't. And so that's why you're told, just do what you're told in the military. Why? Because the general is sitting quietly with some of the highest people in the world who are telling him what they're really doing. And he knows what they're really doing. And he knows what you need to do to keep yourself safe. So he will give you an order based on what his knowledge. He doesn't believe something's happening. He knows what's happening. And so that's why I felt the same way. I don't want to believe anything. I used to go to different churches and talk to different leaders in, in the community and different adults and ask them questions, hoping and wanting to have somebody say, here is the real truth, son. Sit down and be quiet and listen to what I'm going to tell you. And then lay it out for me so I can see it. And for the first time, understand how does a church work? How does the military and the army actually work? Where did the words come from? What are the ideas behind the, the military? All of this stuff, explain it to me so I can understand it. And every time, I'm telling you, every time you do that, if, you, if you're talking to an expert and they explain something to you, you will be amazed how much you didn't know, how much you did not know. You didn't know that the government was involved in certain things they never told you. You didn't know that they had paid money to do something and, and they were going to use you to do it, and you didn't know that. And you thought you understood everything perfectly well, no, it's what you believe, but that's not what's actually happening. And that's why I say all the time, the world does not work the way you think it does. Nothing does. When you get into banking and here, federal bank examiners, as I, as I have been in my personal company and in the personal company with just one-on-one -on -one, and have them explain to me how federal banking institutions in point of fact actually work. It's an extraordinary story. My, I thought to myself, my God, if the public could hear what he just told me and explained to me, I see it. I understand what he's saying now. But it, you know, but the public would never be able to, to handle this. How come, and I remember one of the conversations was, how come you can lease a car, a brand new car, and you lease the car for a few years and then you bring it back and you don't want it anymore. Now you can now you can lease a new car. Well, what are you going to do with the other one? It's a nice car. You've just been driving it for two years. They're not going to be able to lease it anymore because you've already leased. This is a secondhand car. Well, how? Uh, what's going to happen with that car? Well, they're going to sell it somewhere else. Or if they sell it, then you know, they're not going to make up much money off of it. Well, they may sell it to Japan to to melt it down and to make a ship out of it. So don't worry about how they're going to get their money back. They made a lot of money by your leasing it, but there's a lot more you don't know about commerce and banking and money. And so don't worry about it. Just stay out of the way and do your job and don't worry. Don't worry about how the world runs because the people in power, they know what they're doing. And for some reason, it just all seems to work every day. Everybody goes to work, everybody pays the bills, and everybody's eating, and we all just live from one day to the next. But the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Why? Because there's a lot of knowledge you're not privy to know. And so that's why I do what I do. I'm trying to wake people to the idea that there's so much they've been told they have no idea that people go to church, and they have no idea where the word church comes from. We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Church goes back to a word of a goddess in the Middle East called Circe. Circe was a goddess in the Middle East that was discovered by the Knights Templars and by the Crusaders back in the 12th and 13th century A.D. when the Crusaders went into the Middle East to to war 
with the Islamic world and kicked the Islamic world out of Jerusalem for the Pope and for Rome. And then when they came back, the soldiers, when they came back, like all soldiers, when they come home, they've learned a lot about the world they live in. So when the soldiers went to uh, Jerusalem for the Pope and for the Catholic Church, they learned about how the women act in the Middle East. They learned about the drugs. They learned about the kind of alcohol. They learned about the assassins. They learned the politics and the thinking of the people. They learned all the magical stuff that's going on in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. These soldiers learned a lot. They, they came back very educated. And so they brought back with them, when they came back to Europe, the soldiers for the, for the Pope, they were called the Crusaders. Well, they brought back a knowledge about how governments work in the Middle East, what the words mean, what the terms mean, and how to treat people and what to say and what not to say. And so they learned about a goddess named Circe. And Circe, when the when the when these uh, when these Knights Templars came back to Europe, they ended up in Scotland. And from Scotland they became known as the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Rite were the Knights Templars who came back into Europe and then ended up in Scotland. So they become they became known as the Scottish Rite. And so the Scottish Rite Masons, who were the Crusaders, they were, they realized and they understood about the worship of a goddess named Circe. And so in Scottish, Circe became known as Kirk, K-E-R-K. -E so if you're a Christian, on Sunday morning in Scotland, you get up and you go to Kirk, K-E-R-K -E or K-I-R-K, Kirk. And then in English, Kirk becomes church, C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. And so the goddess Circe became the goddess Kirk and, or the goddess church. And so Mother Church was Mother Kirk, Mother Circe. And so you know, then when you go into the ancient belief systems of the, uh, of the Greek philosophers and the Greek mythology, Circe, Mother Circe, was able to, according to the mythology, Mother Circe in the Middle East was able to hypnotize people in mass, and she would bring them into her home, so goes the mythology story. She could bring people into her home and hypnotize them and lock the door behind them so they can't get out, and then she would eat them. She would feed off of them, and they would feed her because she would eat them. And she would take their minds away so they were brainless and she would eat and feed off of them. That was the story of Mother Circe, Mother Kirk, Mother Church. And so that's what's happening today. Mother Church has, a, has the ability to hypnotize people in mass by the millions and bring people into her house. And then she locks the door behind them meaning she locks off your exit. There's no way you're going to get out. If you're in the church, you're not, going, you're not leaving. And if you leave, you're going to be on your own and by yourself with no knowledge, no help, no nothing. And so the people in the church are locked in. Their minds are taken from them, and they cannot think for themselves. And now they're going to be eaten, and therefore they're going to financially give the money to the church yeah. And she's going to, and Mother Church will live off of them. She will eat them and live off of them. And so when you understand this history of religion, you begin to see it. Well, that's what the church is doing. And the church is a corporation. It's a company. By the Knights Templars in the, in the Scottish Rite, it goes back to an old ancient secret society that the Pope sent into the Middle East to take over Jerusalem. And and that's why today churches are a corporation. They they made it into a business, and that's why the different churches are called denominations, like of fives and tens and twenties and fifties and hundreds. Exactly. Money, money is, is divided yeah. into denominations. Well, so are churches because they're that's money. It's a complete corporate operation. Churches and religion. They're in the churches are divided into denominations. But most people don't look at this kind of history because it's a very dark history that most people have no idea about, never heard about it, and know nothing about it. 
And the priests who at the top, like the Jesuits and the Catholic Church and the rabbis and the Hebrew religion, they're not about to tell the people the real story. I mean, I had one rabbi, a very high-ranking, very impressive uh, high-ranking rabbi, tell me many years ago when I asked him about these things. He said, give me a break. Everybody's got a religion. The Catholics have got a religion. Protestants got religion. Muslims have got a religion. I'm Jewish. I got a, I got a family to raise. I got to have a religion too. So I got a religion. So give me a break. Mm. And I said, well, yeah, but what about Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva? Was there a Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva in actual life? And he said, I don't know if there was a Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva. It was just a story. And I said, well, what about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Or Osiris, Isis, Horus? Or Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? And it goes back to the triune gods of the ancient world. Right. And the rabbi said, give me a break. I got a wife and a family. You know, I got to have a religion, too. Yeah. And that's what I do for a living. I'm a rabbi. I teach people. I teach the Jewish people the religion of Judaism. But is it true? I don't know if it's true. I, I don't think it is true. It's just a symbolic story. But it doesn't matter. I have a job to do. I'm making money, so leave me alone. You know, and what, I, so, you know what I yeah, find so, interesting about denominations, though, just before we get too far away from that. And, yeah, you're you're right about all the, these interesting things. And I I uh, got to say, it's, it's very interesting. If somebody out there listening has a chance to really get close to somebody who is a true, like, you know, scholar when it comes to uh, uh, the Torah, you you really do want to talk to them because it is uh, it is rather fascinating once they get beyond you know the typical shul there okay um, but <clears throat> something about denominations that, that strikes me is uh, uh, the Latin because you know I got a message in my Skype uh, when you when you mentioned church and I just just read it now uh, regarding you know the Kirk and Circe you know and this turning into church. Uh, part of that, I think, traveled also through Germany at some point, and uh, there might be a German twist which caused that to happen as well, uh, along with the English, which is kind of fascinating because there's a lot more German in the English language than people seem to realize. Oh, yeah. Um, Boy, is there ever. But but anyway, that that's that's a fascinating thing. But back to the... Um, <laughs> Back, back to this thing about denominations, I think about Latin. Uh, you know, a, a nom, a nome, okay, is uh, is to basically say a name. And when, when you say name, people go, oh, yeah, that's like my name. Or no, to name or a name in Latin did not mean exactly the same thing that you think of it as in English. Uh, it was to literally describe the thing, too. Uh, yes. Like when you named something... You were naming it because that is its name. Um, now I know that sounds, and that's the way you're interpreting it. Yeah, it, it's it's you're not a putting, name. It uh, was putting just putting words to it to try to try describe something, and that, that becomes its name. Right, exactly, and that is really what that word name implies, and that's where it comes from. Okay, so a dinome, uh, you know, d. What does that imply? You are taking it away. Now, that's the fascinating thing. Something that is named something that is in a denomination is now in a grouping where it is detached from what it actually is. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, even further, so the more denominations you have, the further detached they are all together from the original thing. I always found that fascinating when it came to denominations of money because, you know, the more bills you have, usually the less money you have. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. People have lots of small bills, and those float around in much higher quantities. The more the denominations are split up, Jordan, whether it You're is right. money That's or right. <laughs> right. So it's kind of interesting that there are so many different ways to, to sort of decode this, but it's right there. It's right there again. And, and Latin, why do I bring up Latin all the time, which is another question that, 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 that happens during these discussions? Very simple. Um, the legal profession seems to uh, use it. The medical profession seems to use it. Your governments use it. Uh, it does appear to me to still be one of those universally accepted languages, even though they say it's a dead language. So right. to me, there are a lot of clues that are still in there. Uh, uh, based on if you can just reckon with the most basic senses of uh, uh, of what Latin really is. 
And it's not like our language exactly. It's really not. And when you see some of the things that are named in certain ways and some of the words that have survived in not just English, although English is the primary example of everything sort of thrown into a blender, you've called it a designer language, in fact, Jordan, which you're absolutely correct. But when you take a look at German, when you take a look at French, when you take a look at Spanish, when you take a look at Portuguese, the Latin influence on all of that is profound. And yep. English, too. But English is is a weird thing. It's like something else. And, uh, you know, again, it, the, the meanings, the truth of the thing itself is sometimes hidden in a word that we simply utter without even thinking. Which, again, is an interesting metaphor that the language in and of itself uh, promotes huh, ignorance. Confusion. Con- and confusion. Yeah, and I remember reading a long time ago in the library uh, that the word Latin was a word that was applied to the planet Saturn. Mm -hmm. Saturn was called Latin. Saturn, the the planet, Lord of the Rings, was called Saturn. We call it Saturn. Saturn was referred to as Latin. And, of course, the Saturn is a divine principle in the Latin religion. In the Roman Catholic religion, they're worshiping the planet Saturn today. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the Jewish people are worshiping Saturn. <clears throat> On Saturn's day, they go to Temp El, and El was the name of the planet Saturn in the Phoenician Canaanite system. In the ancient world, God was called El, E-L. And so if you went to his home each, each one, once a week, you'd go to his home to show respect for God, and God was El, you would go to Temp El. And Temp El, the Jews go to Temp El. Mm-hmm. And the Jewish Temp El was the house of God. The God is El, E-L is Saturn. And this is why the Jews go to Temp El on Saturday. Friday night, 6 o'clock to Saturday night, 6 o'clock is Saturday. So the Jews go to Temp El on Saturday, Saturn's day. Right. So it has to do, the Jewish religion is based today, not like it was on times before, but based on today, the Jewish religion is basically based on the planet Saturn, Lord of the Ring. That's why the Jews in Hollywood still making movies about their God, Lord of the Rings. Mm. And, of course, Saturn is the Lord of the Rings in heaven. Right. <clears throat> and in Lord of the Rings, one of the last movies in that series was called The Two Towers. Hmm? The Two Towers, mm. the Lord of the Rings, the Jewish God, the Lord of the Rings, and Two Towers. Are we talking about New York, the World Trade Center, the Two Towers? I think you might want to look into that and see the connection between the occult significance of Lord of the Rings, the planet Saturn, and the Two Towers in New York, Mm -hmm. Jack and Boaz. It's a real dark story that's been unfolding for a long time. And most people have no idea, couldn't care less, have never looked into it, and have no concept in their mind what was really going on in New York Mm -hmm. and why it's called the Empire State. It's the state of the new Roman Empire, the Empire State. Mm -hmm. And the two towers were actually Jack and Boaz. And look up these words, look up this whole subject. Just go on my website and join my research website. You will find a lot of stuff there you've never heard before. It's been there in your face all along. You just never knew. No one ever told you what was really going on. And I'm trying to do that now. Right. And you know what's really fascinating is, you know, you you want to talk about something that's really actually been in your face your entire time. What what, what is one of the first things? That you have to learn, you know, when you go to school anywhere or when, when people are just trying to teach you about the world around you. Well, what day is it, Jordan? It's an interesting yeah. thing. Uh, you know, and, and Sunday. Well, that might be the day of the sun. Okay, so Monday, that's moon day. All right, fine. Tuesday is tears day. Now, that's a little odd there because there's this god of death which comes around 
on Tears Day. You know, Wednesday is more like Woden's Day. Thursday is Thor's Day. Friday is Friar's Day. Saturn Day. Oh, Saturday, excuse me, is Saturn Day. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, right on your calendar is the representation of various esoteric symbols. And there it is right in front of you. Why are the days ordered as they are? Uh, yeah, why, did, why is Saturday the last day of the week and the first day of the week is Sunday? Right. Why well, is that? Because you have the Old Testament was the last day of the week, and the New Testament is Christianity takes over the world instead of Judaism, takes over the world, and now it's Sunday begins a new week. The seven. Why is there seven days in a week? It goes back to the constellation of Pleiades. Pleiades had seven bright lights in the in the constellation of Pleiades, seven bright stars. Mm-hmm. That's why today we have seven days of the week, and the Jews celebrate the Judaism with the menorah, with the seven candles. The seven candles are the seven lights of the Pleiades, the mm-hmm. constellation in the sky. All of this is known in history. If you go into the library and sit and read for 20 years, you will find out a lot about religion you've never known before and why things are the way they are and where these ideas have come from. And so in conclusion, since we only have a few moments left, I would say Mm -hmm. go on my website to Jordan Maxwell Show. Anything that's out there that doesn't say the those three words is not mine. Jordan Maxwell's show is my website. Other people are using my name out there on the website, but it's not mine. So don't think you're con- you're, not, you're contacting me or dealing with me. No, right. if you're not on Jordan Maxwell's show, you're not dealing with me. Go on my go on my jordanmaxwellshow dot com, and you will see another website, which is a research website. It's called Jordan Maxwell Research Society. Click on the Jordan Maxwell Research Society, and you will uh, take you to the place where you join that research society. You have to join it, and the reason why is because I'm doing, I'm telling you stuff that it could get me in trouble, and I don't want to get in trouble by talking to the public, and that's what the government's watching me to see what I'm going to say to the public. But if I put it in that joining thing, now it's in private. And the government has nothing to say of what I say in private. It's like the Jordan Maxwell Show. Yeah, it's like the Jordan Maxwell Show private club. You don't have to abide by the same rules as when you're in no. public. So no. there you go. Yeah, it's like that. That's what the research society is. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's why I have a I have a research society website, mm-hmm. Jordan Maxwell Research Society website. You click on that and you join. It's just a one-time contribution for a lifetime membership. One time, just it helps me to keep the the website going because I don't have any money. I don't. I live on, I live my life on donations of which I don't get very many, and so I don't have the money to keep my website going unless I can find people to join my website who want to know, and then I have enough money to at least keep the website operating. I got to pay a, I got to pay a, a webmaster. He's got to live too. So I got to pay a webmaster, pay to keep the the website going, pay for people to use their credit cards. I got to pay for a lot of stuff. I don't have any money, right? And so go on my go on my website, the Jordan Maxwell Show, and join my website, join the research website, and you'll find a lot of information you will never ever see anywhere else in the world. I'm telling you a lot of things on that website you need to know about, and it's all there for you. Right. And real quick, here's the thing, too. I, I want to make this extremely clear because, you know, the other day, Jordan, when I was uh, just surfing around a bit uh, and, and I was on your website and then I entered some terms into a search engine and wound up somewhere else. You know, I, I ran into a website that looked like it could be yours. It, it really did. It looked like it should be yours, in fact. Um, and it had your picture on it. It had your name. But here's the problem. <clears throat> Unless it says... Jordan Maxwell Show dot com. It's not Jordan's, even if it looks that way. Okay, so don't be fooled. Uh, the Research Society is a slightly different web address, but if you got in there, you know how you got in. 
Uh, but the fact is that the only public stop, the only place if you're looking to search this topic or any other uh, that is is related to a discussion you heard with Jordan on this show or any other place, fact is you have to go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Some websites might even look like they're his. Really, but they're not. <laughs> uh, it's just right. that simple. I mean, you know. I, 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 but I wanted to stress that because I literally landed on a page where I was like, well, this looks really kind of nice, actually, but this isn't Jordan's. Nope. Uh, you know, and, and it was uh, not every website. Some of them are crap, too, by the way. Uh, but it, it's it's there are so many people trying to use Jordan for their own purposes. Uh, you know, to make and, money off of my work or my name. Yeah, or, or or to put out their nonsense and you know put it under the banner of Jordan Maxwell. I, I, there's a lot of different motives here, but the fact is that there's only one place to go uh, for Jordan Maxwell, and it's his website. And if you email Jordan Maxwell on that website, you'll actually be emailing with Jordan Maxwell. You'll if you make a donation, the money will actually go to him. You buy one of those streaming videos, you still have those up, right? I yeah, sure do. Yep, there's some streaming but, videos. But there. I would say, don't email me on Jordan Maxwell Show, and email me and say, Jordan, is this really your website? I'm telling you, you're right. hearing my voice. That's <laughs> all I could. Hearing my voice on the radio saying, yes, this is my personal website that I own. Period. That's it, and it's, it's the only Jordan one. Maxwell Show, and it's so the. Don't yeah, I'm Don't sorry. Don't email and ask me, is this really your website? Yes, it really is my website. And it's the only one. There is not the another. The only one. Right. It's only one is jordanmaxwellshow.com. <laughs>